Susan B is taking me on to their new pasture we just put them on today. She thought I had her lamp, but she's out here somewhere. So they're all on, this is, we still have the rams in, ram lambs in with their mothers. So this is the entire ewe and lamb crop. And they will probably have this cleaned up. I think he usually puts them on for three days. Take a little stroll. old O'Brien. <laughs> we didn't breed her. Little ram lamb. Who are you out of, mister? crew of yearlings here these three there's two great cat muggets and then Amelia without <laughs> still needing to get rude finishing the neck she's a little high-spirited so I'm not looking forward to that job Hi, girls Like, sorry. Looks like there's a little gap there. Just gonna make sure. Hello. Hello, a little girl. That's one of the Lara's lands. I just um, washed a little bit of the there Susan B's little land that she was looking for. She's way over there. Yeah, I guess it looks pretty good. In the distance, it looked like there was a gap. That was good. Comfortable. Hi, Adriana. You don't know me today, huh? And the boys, so we're sharing a fence line, which is a, not a normal thing for us to do. My um, yearling rams are over there. You can see them walking to the fence line. If we were closer to the fall breeding season, that would be an absolute no-no, but it's all right here. Oh, who's this? I think this is Fanny's little girl. Hi, honey. Oh, you're so soft. You're so soft and sweet.
You hot? I know. I love you too. Okay. More lambs there. There's Septima. She'll probably come over and say hello. Hello there, little princess. <laughs> oh, oh, here come some babies. Hi. Hey there, honey. Oh, yes. Oh, my girls. <laughs> Not sure who you are. What did you get yourself into? It's a girl. And there's Septima. <laughs> oh, my babies. I love you. There's Susan B's little girl. Hey, honey. Look curious. Curious, but she's just not sure. Not 100%. Not like my other girls here. Here is Audi's little girl. We sometimes get confused if she remembers that she likes Septima breathing. <laughs> you were so in my face. Okay, I love you. I love you. Yes, I do. Okay, oh, there's Alice Paul. You guys have such a nice pasture here to work on. There's Nita's little monster. What are you doing? Huh? Oh, I love my lambies. Hello. <laughs> Something was like, what about me? I love you. Take you in the house. So today I'm going to take you on a tour of the property and I'm fortunate to be accompanied by my sheep fancier friend who um, she's been in a couple other videos helping me with stuff. She's my producer. And um, so I thought we would just go around and stop at certain locations on the property and she's going to ask me questions that possibly you've been thinking of and I haven't addressed in past videos. So let's get going. What time of year is it? Ah, you say it's the middle of July. It's 
crazy hot today, so the girls are going to be spending a lot of time in the barn. I did get a question about what do they do for shade, because there's no trees in our pasture. But that's what they do. When it's time to get in the shade, they just come in the barn. Round, it occurs to me to ask you why is there a swimming pool ladder <laughs> on your fence line? So <laughs> there's a couple things going on. Number one is we don't like to put a lot of gates around the outer perimeter because that is just opportunity for ingress or egress so lambs getting out or predators getting in. So we try to minimize that as much as we can. We can we have it set up that we can access every pasture with a tractor if we need to, but it's all from the inside. So I put the style up, I call that my style. It's the pool ladder. Number, there's a couple reasons. Number one is I can't stand throwing out plastic. Landfill plastic makes me crazy. So I always try to repurpose as much plastic as I can. And this was our pool ladder before we had the deck. It makes a terrific style, so if I want to access the ewes in the barn, I can get at them this way and that way they don't run out. If I come at them from the north side, like if I come out of the house and go in the barn, they leave the barn. So if there's a day where maybe I want to do feet or whatever and they're already out, I can access the barn this way, lock them in, and it's just better. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you want me to show you of me getting on there? Yes, I think you should demonstrate how this works. <laughs> Get some steps in. Look at that, very stable. Excellent work. Okay, so where have we seen this, this view before up the side of the longest pasture line? Um, so yeah, I have a video, all seasons video actually, but there's a winter video I did a few years ago where I cross countryed around the perimeter of the property to get a pretty winter view. So if you click on the link to that video here, you'll be able to enjoy that. So this path is accessible all year round. So just so you know, that ladder, for those of you concerned about my safety, um, it's loaded with sand. So there's probably about 15 pounds of sand on the bottom inside. So it's really pretty stable. You tip it over. You could tip it over, but you really you have, have to try. try very hard. Yeah. You have to do some gymnastic it's, it's, flips it's very on the safe. Top. Okay. For the wildlife yeah it's a little green and swampy it's probably about a foot deep usually that that dry if this dries up on really in really dry summers you can actually walk across it and there are turtles living in there for certain and this is an area where you have had a trail camera set up yeah and uh, some of the wildlife you've seen back here um tons of deer raccoons possums loads of rabbits rabbits and then um, an unidentified, it could be like a mink or something like that, or a um, weasel. It was long with a tail, furry. This looks like a, an animal trail that goes through the woods. Yeah, there's the woods. tons of them. So this past 
back here, Rich and I cleared this. We took the tractor back here and ripped out because this was covered with bushes just like this all the way around the circle. Cut down trees, added a couple bumps for the fun. To fling your passengers about. Yes, exactly. Onwards! There's a pond and a trail there somewhere, folks. <laughs> it's, in, it's in summer disguise right now. Okay. So this is my favorite tree. I call it the Mighty Oak. And we also have a dream someday of clearing this out underneath and putting a nice swing up there but it's just an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous tree. There appears to be a random wooden wall. <laughs> Would you like to tell us the story of this? Okay. So this structure, Rich built, and it's actually, it's a soccer wall. So both of our sons played soccer in high school. And this was designed for them to kick up against and practice and whatnot. Our neighbors thought we were building another barn because Rich has a tendency to make things like a mighty fortress. So there is, all the posts are in concrete. There's actually posts on the other side to support it. So we could, if we wanted to, turn this into some sort of a structure, but it is, it's the soccer ball that the boys use to practice. <laughs> sheep farm day camp all of these sycamores will have hammocks on them and my guests will be able to take a little break and watch the sheep That's enjoy a, the breeze view from the hammock one way sheep view from the hammock the other way there's another large pond it's also a little hard to see at this time of year So one thing I would like to do in the near future is build a structure somewhere on the property. I'm thinking somewhere here that would be a space for classes, day camps, um, doing demonstrations, things that right now I really don't have a space for. You know, if you wanted to come out here in the winter and spend the day, other than being inside the house, which we're not really comfortable with, there's really no place for you to be comfortable. So this would be that space. I'm thinking two bedrooms, shared bathroom, and then a big open area with kitchen work for like a dyeing lab or, you know, washing fleeces or whatever. And I think I want to put it right about here. And I'm using, I use this large poplar tree to sort of anchor me. So I've got the poplar tree here and I'm thinking it would be, there's probably 75, hundred feet between me and that tree. And we could certainly put the building here. It's about 200 feet from the road. There is a way to access. There'd be a long driveway that could come down here. This is the dream. The pond is right there. So we would clear the pond brush there so that you know we'd have like a front porch and they could see the pond. And then they could also, you would be able to view this pasture. And then, like I said, if we did ever build pasture on this side, You'd be able to see it there as well so that's kind of i think we're going to do it i think it's just 
Right now, I kind of want to wait until interest rates go down and material costs go down a little bit. So there's no real urgency, but. So you've been talking to me quite a bit about your dream yeah. of accommodation. You've mentioned farm stay for people doing courses. Yep. But was there not another aspect to building on the farm that was also part of a future dream? So yeah, so one thing I want, a couple years ago during the pandemic, um, I got a call from a, a student that it goes to one of the ag schools around us. And there's actually quite a few of them. There's probably like five or six agricultural schools. And she was studying in the nutrition program and she needed an internship as part of her coursework. And she was interested in coming here and working here. And at that time, I didn't have accommodations because one of the things about it, having an intern is you really need to have a place for them to live on the property because most of them aren't from around here. And I didn't have it at that time. So yes, one of the ideas for that structure as well would be to house an intern who then could help on the farm, help with projects, you know, just all sorts of things that we could do. Um, so yeah, so that was another part of the idea. And I know you had uh, other ideas of maybe having a trailer or a shepherd's hut or a tiny home and then realizing that demonstrating spinning wheels and sorting fleeces in a tiny house doesn't fit in a yeah. tiny house so this would be a more permanent structure you're going to yeah. have to deal with the town and get permits to do septic yep. and water and yep it'll have a so. frame it'll be a framed structure and i'll probably build it we were talking about doing a modular but i just like to build so don't sign up yet folks <laughs> but you know yeah. you'll see the progress on this channel yeah. keep watching subscribe <laughs> like thumbs up hit the notification <laughs> bell <laughs> all that good stuff yeah. onwards okay The large pond, the larger pond that's by the barn. What is your favorite wildlife sighting at this pond? I got a turtle that lives on that. She comes up on that stone oh. there. Oh yeah, there's concrete. So Rich dumped a thing of concrete, leftover concrete from some project there. And so that's a little perch. Turns I... out to be a turtle sunspot yep. favorite. Yep, and we just put some grass carp in there. So I've got footage, actually I'll put it in here of uh, putting the carp in the pond. You ready? Right. <laughs> grass right there Hannah oh this is this is bad stuff she doesn't like this and that's from UK oh sorry invasive yeah, coming going. over here that is not an indigenous plant it is extremely damaging to the wildlife so sometimes when she's really furious she comes I do hacks it jumps it out look at that some of the There's some debris from it the roots right there I don't want to put that in the landfill because I'm afraid it'll sprout somewhere else so I'm trying to get it really dry she's cooking it in the <laughs> four-wheeler okay Lots of clover and trefoil in here. That yellow flower is the trefoil. Yeah. So 
Before lambing started, I was working on a breed study with the Genesee Valley Hand Spinners Guild. And the breed that we're working on right now that we're going to be covering at the June meeting is Polypay. And I've learned a lot in a couple episodes before where I interviewed a couple of the breeders and sort of set up my structure for my study. And today what I'm doing is I'm going to be experimenting with some Corridale fiber I have here. It's washed, roving, um, to check and see what the proper amount of Kool-Aid I need to use and water for the very small amount of fiber I'm going to be dyeing for each one of my breed samples. So for example, I got 32 grams of washed fiber from the breed study um, used for the polypay. And of that, I've designated only three grams to dye. And three grams of fiber is right here. It's not a ton. It's one, two, three, seven locks. So what I'm going to do right now I'm not going to use this fiber yet. I'm going to just practice on my Corridale fiber. And I found some instructions about how to dye using Kool-Aid in your microwave. And the instructions seemed very simple and straightforward. You pretty much just make up a dye, put your fiber in it, and then microwave it on high for one minute and check to see if the dye has all been absorbed into your fiber. So I'm imagining I don't need the entire packet of fiber for such a, the entire packet of Kool-Aid for such a small amount of fiber. So I'm going to measure out three grams of this Corydale fiber. There's one and a half, 2.7. Three point one grams, so that's good enough. So that's it. That's what I'm going to be using, and I'm going to do, use the same amount and the same amount of dye for each breed, so I have a very consistent process. And then that way we can look at the different samples after they've been dyed to see how they picked up the dye, because it's going to be the same mixture of dye every time. Okay. So I've got my three grams of fiber. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure out cats. Measure out some Kool-Aid. So I'm going to tear out my jar to zero, and then I'm just going to okay. So there's 1.1 grams. No, it's at one, so I'm going to write that down. Okay, so Kool-Aid I'm usually is the orange artificial flavor unsweetened drink mix, so it doesn't have the sugar. But I was watching a video and the lady said that it's got the dye in it, and it also has citric acid, which I guess helps it to be color fast. I don't know very much about dyeing, but anyway, so I bought some of these packets, and that's what I'll be using as we go forward here. Okay, so one gram of Kool-Aid. And then I was thinking I might put 12 ounces of water, which is about a cup and a half. And this is just a spaghetti jar. Okay, so there's 12 ounces of water. I'm not going to wet my fiber. They say that you should dampen your fiber, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to put it right in here. First, I'm going to get my Kool-Aid out of here so I don't accidentally get it wet. We have these little Tupperware containers. I think they're supposed to be for, like, if you take your lunch to work and you have a salad, and this is for your salad dressing, which I've never used for that. If I'm going to bring a salad, I just put the dressing on in the morning. 
if I'm going to work, which I don't do anymore, so all sorts of reasons why that thing doesn't make sense. But now it's a dye container. All right, so I'm just going to put the fiber, what did I say, three grams of fiber in the bath. I chose orange because I do like using orange wool for um, pumpkin kits, I make. Yeah, it's going to soak it right up. If it soaks it right up and it's not nice and orange, I might do another run with a little bit more of the Kool-Aid in there. Okay, so now I'm going to put it in the microwave. Whoopsie. It's already set for high for one minute. So there's still dye in the water. So we're going to keep going another minute. It's actually a little bit hot. Looks like the dye is getting picked up a little. One more minute. Okay, there's bubbles. really cool. Oh, what's that going on there? So the water is clear. It's so cool when stuff actually <laughs> works. So it looks to me though, I think I could have put more dye in there. I'm going to try this again using a gram of fiber and two gram, maybe I'll just put the whole packet in. Because I know the girl, I watched a woman do it on uh, whatever, YouTube or something, and she had a skein of yarn and she put in quite a few packets of Kool-Aid. So I think that this will be my first sample. what I'm supposed to do with it now. So I'm going to do another one with a full packet of Kool-Aid. That's hot. And 12 ounces of water again. But I'll run it for a minute at a time and then we'll see if the water comes out clear and if you know, well, obviously, what the f if the fiber looks darker or anything like that. i got to remember what that sample is, too. Okay, full packet. Good thing I got groceries tomorrow. I need to get more.
write stuff down. Three grams. So that's 3.8. There's three grams of fiber right there. Okay, we'll see you in a bit. So this was the full packet of Kool-Aid, and it was after five minutes. This thing was really hot. And this looks more like it did in the video where it had like this white creamy color versus being perfectly clear. So that's the full packet of Kool-Aid for one gram of fiber. That's a lot oranger. So this is the pack, full packet, and this is probably about half a packet. So for going forward, for my three grams of fiber, I'm going to use a full packet of Kool-Aid. So this is what the remaining water looks like. I'm pretty sure I went five minutes. I think. Um, I'll need to use pennies next time because I think I lost track, but what, it was boiling when I took it out of the microwave this last time. Okay, so I'm going to dump that out. And now I'm going to use the polypane fiber because I have one more packet left. Sticking with my 12 ounces of water. That seemed to work pretty good. Alright, so I'm going to put my fiber in now. This is different because the fiber I used from the Coradale was roving. So this has got a lot of this tip, but I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm just going to put it right all in there. So now I have my process for all of my different breed studies, which is what I wanted to accomplish here today. And this time I'm going to use spoons to keep track because I lost track the last time and I have to admit that. Toothpicks. I'll use toothpicks. So I'm going to put five toothpicks on this side. So for every time I take it out of the microwave, I'll move a toothpick over. This is our little man of the three kittens. My little baby. This Gandalf. He is so sweet. He lets me hold him like he's a little baby. <laughs> Don't check. All right, we gotta do our experiment. Oh, 
Oh, I can't hear it, Lily. I did also, in the last couple weeks during lambing, so I didn't really have a chance to enjoy it, uh, Kim Boyce at Fairly Fiber Fun. She's got a nice YouTube channel with all sorts of fiber related stuff, and she does a lot with um, different breeds and whole fleeces and stuff. And she has a shop. So she sent me a large bag of poly pay from a farm that's local around her. She's down in Georgia. And I learned during the interviews, right, that poly pay, they're not really focusing on a particular type of fleece. So it could actually express any of the breeds, particular fleece type characteristics, just depending on, you know, how but the, that breeder is selecting. Remember, um, in the one interview she said, uh, Ann said that um, certain breeders select for certain things within the five breeds, so I thought that was interesting. Took it out of the microwave, so that's the second time. This is Tabitha, if you remember her. She was the one with the little scarecrow nose. She loves to come to <laughs> visit me when I'm on the toilet, actually. And she'll come up and sit with me at night while I'm watching television. <laughs> Pretending you don't know me. This is Sabrina. If you remember the beautiful Sabrina. She's so sweet. Those are my three little kittens. They're growing up. They're probably almost a year now. Trixie, I'm not going to bother trying to hold her. Remember the last time <laughs> how that went? She doesn't like it, does she? Oh, I love my kittens. Ooh, it's boiling now. I'm going to drop this on one of you guys. So i got one more minute to go. I'm kind of afraid to, though, because of how it's boiling. So Maybe I only did four minutes on that last run. I'm going to do another minute. Water clear. I'm nervous that glass is going to crack in there. But that'll be the fifth time. Get these toothpicks for the next time. Oh, that's it. This is it. Five minutes. Boiling. <laughs> it's boiling and the water is still cloudy. This one is the polypay sample. And I'm noticing certain parts of it got picked up more dye than other parts. But 
Let's see. You know, I don't really know what's, what good or bad is. To me, that kind of looks cool. I guess if you wanted it to all be consistent, I should have maybe separated it more. I'll do that next time. Right? Because it's not kind of a fair comparison because the Coradale was um, roving, so it was already sort of evenly split up and distributed. So the polypay is kind of... Probably the stuff that wasn't as open didn't get as much dye. I don't know. Anyway, so so that's good. Got that one done. So I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna give them a rinse, just a hot water rinse, to continue the process, and then um, dry them, and then I'll have that as my dyed sample for my records. <laughs>